Leaky gut equals leaky brain. Close to 100% of patients who report to my clinic for whatever they're there for will have leaky gut by blood test. Those who report a cognitive issue, whether it's brain fog, whether it's mommy brain, or whether it's Parkinson's or you know, beginning Alzheimer's, every one of those people have markers of a leak in the blood-brain barrier. Our guest today is New York Times bestselling author, Stephen Gundry, MD, and he is an award-winning cardiologist and the founder and director of the International Heart and Lung Institute in Palm Springs, California. You know, you're a distinguished cardiologist, research scientist, and you're well aware that heart disease has been the number one killer in the United States for many years. But your recent research is indicating that Unfortunately, we tend to look right at the cardiovascular system when we're talking about heart health, but you're connecting the gut and the health of our gut to our cardiovascular system, to our brain health, and so much more. So let's start off by talking about that connection. Yeah, you know, it's funny. I was um, on the phone to David Perlmutter, who's become a friend of mine, um, grain brain and drop acid. There I gave you a plug, David. Um, and who's it was a great neurologist and we were laughing i said isn't it weird that a heart surgeon and cardiologist and a neurologist would be talking about the gut the gi tract that you know as as the real instigator of all the problems in our very different disciplines and it's you know literally hippocrates said 2500 years ago all disease begins in the gut and I spent now 25 years trying to figure out how he knew this, and I get closer every year. But yeah, um, and I used some examples in, in Gut Check about uh, the cholesterol hypothesis of causing heart disease. And it's okay if you like that hypothesis, but it's a hypothesis, and there's plenty of other ones. The, the interesting thing, and I, I, I tell the tale of two patients. One who's a guy in his late 60s, um, who is an administrator for a big, uh, actually, a surgical group, and he had horribly high cholesterol numbers. Total cholesterol is above 500. LDLs, the so-called bad cholesterol, of over 400. And his the people he worked for said, oh, geez, you know, you're a walking dead man, you're gonna have a heart attack. And, you know, you need to be on statin drugs. And he tried a few statin drugs, but they it really had some bad effects on him. So he was off of them. And he's in his, you know, late 60s now. And they finally convinced him to get a CT coronary angiogram. A really nice 3D view of the heart. Very, very accurate. Looking for plaques. That's very different than a CT uh, calcium score. Totally different. And this is literally an angiogram. And at the same time, he had made an appointment to see me to see what I thought about all this. And we do blood work uh, that's a lot different than most folks do. So he gets the results of his angiogram, and his arteries are perfectly clear. They're gorgeous. There's not a plaque anywhere to be seen. So when he brings that in, and I look at his blood work, and I said, well, I could have saved you the trouble because there's nothing in here in this blood work that would predict that you would develop coronary artery disease. And he goes, whoa, 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 what about my LDL cholesterol, 400? And I said, well, you're not oxidizing it, and you got to activate cholesterol to be interested in sticking. And your blood vessels actually have to be sticky. They have to be lined with fly paper and you have to have markers of inflammation. And you have none of those, so I would have predicted that you would have no coronary disease. And he was kind of apoplectic, and I said, so after you got your clean coronary scan, what did your cardiologist want you to do? And he said, well, that's just it. He wants to get, put me on statins. And I go, huh? And he says, well, we gotta keep you the way you are. Well, here's a 68-year-old guy with no plaque, why in the world would you start a statin drug? Prophylactically. I have another patient about the same age who's had multiple stents, coronary bypass, and his LDL cholesterol 
on statin therapy and another therapy. His LDL is 44. I mean, 44. The other guy's is 440. And this guy, when we look at his numbers, this little bit of cholesterol is ultra-activated. His blood, blood vessels are sticky. And it's no wonder that this guy is, even with this little bitty nothing cholesterol, is still clogging up his blood vessels. So it's kind of the tale of two cities. Uh, cholesterol really had nothing to do with this guy's problem. It was, quite frankly, his diet and his gut microbiome and his leaky gut that was actually causing inflammation on the surface of his blood vessels. And cholesterol is basically a spackling compound. That's the part right there. You know, I just gave this analogy. There was a young man who was concerned about having high cholesterol. His dad is on a statin. And this kid, he's like, he's in his early 20s. And he's trying to eat his diet and avoid cholesterol like the plague. And I gave him the analogy of, you know, first of all, cholesterol is one of the most vital nutrients in our bodies. You know, our liver makes it on tap every day to build our sex hormones, which is kind Correct. of important. But also it's there for repair. And to classify these forms of cholesterol, and I broke it down for him, HDL, high density lipoprotein, low density lipoprotein, LDL. Did I say cholesterol in either of those terms? He's like, no, you didn't. I was like, those are carriers, right? And your liver is shipping some, some places and some stuff is getting scooped up and sent back to actually recycle and use cholesterol because it's so important. And sometimes there can be damage in the artery, for example, and we find, okay, there's some cholesterol buildup here, but it's kind of like there's a bunch of firemen at, a, at the site of a fire, right? And then you blame the firemen for starting that fire, but the firemen are there probably trying to help out, but they get villainized, right? That's what's causing the problem. Instead of the inflammation, flame, that is really more of the culprit. And so connecting the gut and this potential catalyst for inflammation to our heart health is something we don't think about. Yeah, that's right. Um, and what's really, I guess, sad is that when we look at people with coronary artery disease, um, they have, 100% of them have leaky gut by our measurements, by blood tests. And as I talk about in the book, what's really shocking is that 100% of these people and other people have antibodies to the various forms of wheat, wheat germ agglutinin, gluten, non-gluten wheat proteins. 100% of them have antibodies to these proteins in wheat. And you go, well, that's interesting. And a lot of these people are eating gluten-free because uh, they're worried about gluten, and yet they have antibodies to it. Um, and like I've talked about in other books, but now we've got a huge patient series, there's this protein in whole wheat called wheat germ agglutinin. And it is a little tiny lectin. And it's so tiny that it can actually get through the wall of our gut uh, without uh, leaky gut. It can actually go right through. And the weird thing is this guy will attach to the lining of our blood vessels. And in fact, the lining of the blood vessels, which is called the glycocalyx, uh, was first discovered and identified by radioactive labeling wheat germ agglutinin and injecting it, and lo and behold, it lit up this lining of blood vessels. So every time we have that healthy whole wheat, you know, piece of toast for heart health, uh, we're actually ingesting one of the biggest inflammatory markers marker molecules ever made and it's sticking to our blood vessels <laughs> this should be like front page splinter. news it this should crazy the reason it's not front page news is because the cereal cor corporations would really and the bread corporations would not like you to know that information that's pretty inflammatory oh yeah it's very <laughs> inflammatory wow you know we were talking about this before we got started about this, you know, there's a lot more data coming out on this, but it's been going on for years and years and years with this contamination 
with glyphosate in relationship to a lot of these grains. So in some respects, it's not just the grain itself, but it's the compounds that we're using to grow these grains in mass today. And by the way, a lot of these crops are, I mean, the hallmark of them, they're utilized for prim primarily ultra processed foods that show up through the drive through window and, and you know, uh, on store shelves. But let's talk a little bit about that. Let's talk a little bit about glyphosate. Yeah. So glyphosate's been around about 50 years now. And it was patented by Roundup glyphosate was patented as an antibiotic. It was not patented as a weed killer. And that should have set off alarm bells, but I guess it didn't. And so glyphosate, people still kind of associate glyphosate with uh, GMO crops, and that was its original reason to be sprayed on soybeans and corn that would resist glyphosate. But now, uh, factory farms are so big that when you get a harvester, which costs you now millions of dollars, you want that harvester on a field on a particular day. And you want that field ready to harvest. You don't want to wait for weather, uh, the crop to die and then desiccate. So most commercial crops, oats, rye, barley, wheat, soybeans, corn, are sprayed with Roundup to kill the plant. And a dead plant, desiccated, is a lot easier to harvest. Um, yeah. Water is a pain in the neck to harvest things. So it's now used on almost all commercial grains to speed the harvest. And so you could have a harvester on field X on such and such a day, knowing full well that that crop will be dead and ready to harvest because that's efficient. So two things happen. Number one, they don't wash the glyphosate off. Those grains then go to two places. They're either fed to our animals and glyphosate is incorporated into their flesh or perhaps even worse, they're fed to us. They go into all of our grain products and they appear in our cereals, they appear in our breads, they appear in our pizza. And so we get a, basically a double dose of glyphosate with almost everything we eat. The problem with that is that glyphosate is number one, an antibiotic and it kills our gut microbiome. But it's actually very specific, and I talk about that in Gut Check. It actually kills off the part of the gut microbiome that's involved in the tryptophan pathway, which is the feel-good hormone pathway that makes 5-HTP and serotonin. And we used to think that most of the serotonin that we get was from our brain. That was wrong. Then we said, no, it's in the nerve cells down in the gut. That's where it's coming from. Nope, we were wrong. It's actually produced by bacteria for the most part. Those are the bacteria that glyphosate really kills. Mm. And so isn't it odd that over the last 50 years, we can blame social media and let's do it, but our epidemic of anxiety and depression directly correlates with glyphosate use. Mm. And these, these plants become more and more resistant to glyphosate, so every year more and more glyphosate is applied to them to kill them. On top of that, getting back to your original proposition, glyphosate causes leaky gut by itself. You don't need any other activity. So I'll give you some great examples that I talk about in the book. About 80% of my patients have autoimmune diseases. That's why they come to see me. And knock on wood, we're really good at reversing it. About 94% of people with an autoimmune disease in one year's time are in remission on no meds, uh, no markers of their autoimmune disease. And they're really happy, obviously. And a lot of these people will go over to Europe and how can you resist? They have croissants, they have baguettes, they have pizza, they have pasta, and they don't react to it. And they don't flare their psoriasis, their Crohn's doesn't flare, their rheumatoid arthritis doesn't flare, their Hashimoto's thyroiditis doesn't flare. And they come back and they go, oh, Dr. Gundry, you've cured me, thank you, I can have all these wonderful foods. 
two weeks later, they're on the phone going, what the heck happened? You know, my psoriasis just popped out. My, you know, my rheumatoid arthritis, my, my gut feels awful. And I said, I bet you started eating our bread and our pizza. And they said, well, yeah, because I'm cured. I said, no, our, our stuff's got the glyphosate, and that's what started. Mm. And we see it all, all the time. I just saw a patient this week, exact same thing happened to yeah, I've heard that story again and again and again from, from people as well. You know, they go to other countries and can have all these things and then they come back here and it's just not the same. And on top of that, the WHO has this huge list now, it's just getting longer and longer, of known carcinogens in our personal care products and our food supply, just in the environment in general. Glyphosate is categorized as a group 2A carcinogen, which is a probable causing cancer agent for for humans yep no big deal it's probably it's not for it. sure you know but it's just like if we think about the mechanisms behind it you know and how it's damaging our protective entity really our gut is like the the front line of our immune system in many ways and like i love this book so much and i got to read an early copy of course and it's really pointing to how all this stuff works like you're really demystifying this incredible connection and we talked a little bit about heart health, that connection. I want to talk a little bit more about the brain because you mentioned serotonin. And we think it's a brain thing, you know, because we kind of live upstairs. But this also ties back to something with the cardiovascular system and statins that I want to point out. What we see when folks get onto a statin is some interesting side effects typically pop up. This study was published in the journal Current Diabetes Reports. And the researchers, and this was a big meta-analysis, they're looking at a lot of different studies, and this is what they stated. Statin therapy increases the risk of diabetes by 9% to 12% in the two meta-analyses. Meta -analyses. This is multiple studies of multiple studies Correct. of statin trials. And, listen to this, statin therapy increases the risk of diabetes by upwards of 99% in five population-based studies. They stated, quote, statin therapy impairs insulin sensitivity and insulin secretion based on clinical and epidemiological studies, unquote. That's banana bananas in pajamas. Not only do we see increased risk of diabetes, we see muscle pain and weakness. We see cognitive dysfunction. And so to proactively or prophylactically put people onto a statin, it's like, oh, just to, just to be safe without informed consent about these other things is a huge problem. And so to circle all this back, let's talk about the real connection here with improving our cognitive function, our brain health by focusing on a gut check. Yeah, uh, there's a chapter, leak, if you, leaky gut equals leaky brain. And what's sad to say is literally Close to 100% of patients who report to my clinic for whatever they're there for uh, will have leaky gut by blood test. And those who report a cognitive issue, whether it's brain fog, whether it's mommy brain, whether it's you know mild cognitive impairment, or whether it's Parkinson's or you know beginning Alzheimer's, every one of those people have markers of a leak in the blood-brain barrier. Now, the blood-brain barrier is this really amazing tight barrier between everything in the bloodstream and the brain. The brain is this sacrosect organ, and it's this blood-brain barrier is so impenetrable that if you had a brain tumor and I wanted to give you chemotherapy, I could put all the chemotherapy in the world into your veins and it would never get into your brain. It would not get past this barrier. In fact, you have to put it in the spinal cord, in the uh, spinal, fi spinal fluid to actually get it to where it needs to go. It's that tight. And yet when we see people with leaky gut, we see that they are attacking this blood-brain barrier and it's become porous. And then we can see actual neurons 
inflamed in the brain and it's called neuroinflammation. Mm. And so, holy cow, this whole process of these neurodegenerative diseases, which are now an epidemic, you can tie directly back to their source, which is actually the gut and not the problem with the brain. So we've, we've been looking in the wrong places. Uh, and it's shocking to these patients who go, what the heck? You know, my brain's on fire and, you know, all the, all the guardrails are down and, you know, this stuff is getting right through my brain. Uh, and we're seeing, I see a number of patients now with early onset Parkinson's disease. A couple months ago, I saw a woman who's 37 years old with active Parkinson's. And I just started treating a 46-year-old gentleman with active Parkinson's. And when you look at these folks, they, their gut is wide open leaky, their blood-brain barrier is down, and we can actually see attack on the motion centers in their brain. Now, the good news is, and the reason I see them is we can seal their leaky gut. And the exciting thing is when we do that, their leaky, their leaky brain stops and the neuroinflammation goes away. This 37-year-old woman had a horrible left-sided tremor. It would be like this the entire time. And now she has, you can kind of see a little twitch in one finger but everything else is gone, and almost all of her neuroinflammation in six months' time is, is all quiet, just by sealing her gut, just by changing the food she was eating. Pretty exciting. Dr. G, you're a gift to humanity, seriously. You know, you've been in practice for decades and helping so many people. It's just like, this isn't just theory. This is what's possible, and you've got case after case after case and still, the mission is so big because, unfortunately, even in the age of the Internet, a lot of people aren't aware of this information. And the fact that you've consolidated this into Gut Check and also just such a uh, such an attractive title, right? Because it's like the, you're the king of the double entendre as well, <laughs> you know, but this is really a gut check for all of us, you know, to get educated and to share this information because there's too much senseless suffering that's taking place. And now to steer this conversation to, okay, even though we might not relate our heart issues to our gut health or our cognitive decline or a neurodegenerative condition and many other conditions, you said it, you kicked the show off with this, Hippocrates, thousands of years ago, all disease begins in the gut. Like, we've got to get this memo. Now the question is, how do we do it? How do we give ourselves a gut check? How do we improve the health? of our gut, I want to talk about, are there some specific foods? Is there some specific tenets? We'll get to that in a moment, but one of the flagship things that you talk about is the importance of diversity. So let's yeah. talk about that first. Well, one of the things that if you, if you look at super old people, late 90s, actually 105 and above, and you look at their microbiome, and the microbiome should be a hundred trillion organisms in our gut. And to give you an idea of how big that is, uh, it was recently discovered, there was a count, there are eight trillion trees on planet Earth. Eight trillion. There are 92 trillion more bacteria in each of our guts than there are trees on planet Earth. That's a big number. Yeah. So this is a tropical rainforest that we didn't even know existed until the Human Microbiome Project started in 2006. We didn't know these guys were there. We had no idea of how important they were, what they did. And because of that project, we now know there are at least 10,000 different species of bacteria in our gut. And we can categorize them as good guys and bad guys. And a lot of companies are trying to convince you that the bad guys are really bad. And all we want is good guys. But one of the foundations of gut check is, believe it or not, 
and I hate to use the expression, it takes a village that you've got to have bad guys and good guys in your gut, and they actually play important roles. The other thing that's important is that we used to think, well, you got to eat fiber, and fiber is really important, and soluble fiber is the key to health, and there's a lot of truth to that. But one of the revelations of gut check is you could eat all the fiber you want. You could take inulin or inositol, and you will never improve your gut vitamin gut diversity and you will never improve your inflammatory markers and this was done by the husband and wife Sonnenberg team in Stanford but if you give that fiber soluble fiber to volunteers along with fermented foods things like yogurt kefir vinegars then and only then will the gut become more diverse different species and will inflammatory markers go down? So what's up? Well, as the book says, you've got a whole uh, assembly line, a car assembly line of pieces to make the final product. And the final product in a lot of cases is a short chain fatty acid called butyrate. And butyrate is one of the most important things all of us need. For you name it, you need butyrate there are butyrate producing bacteria. The problem is most of them have to have some products from other bacteria to make butyrate. So you could give these guys all the soluble fiber you want, but if they don't have precursors for making butyrate, it'll be never be made. So this gut diversity is huge. All right, so now let's go back and look at these 105 year old people who are thriving. Number one, one of the hallmarks is that they have an incredibly diverse gut microbiome, much like actually a 30-year-old would. The second thing that's really cool, which is really probably most important, is that these microbiomes love to eat xenobiotics. Now, what are heck is xenobiotics? I've heard probiotics, prebiotics, postbiotics, xenobiotics are all these xenoestrogens, artificial plastics that are in our environment, fragrances that are toxic, as most of us are beginning to find out. This set of bacteria is really good at eating all of these toxins. In fact, I was just on one of the big mold shows, and if molds were the problem that everybody seems to think they are, then everyone in New Orleans should be dead. Um, right? And they're not. What's happened? Well, bacteria, believe it or not, compete with fungus and mold. They actually don't like each other very much. They're after the same stuff. The socias and the greasers. Exactly. So they each will eat the harmful compounds that each produce to, as a defensive mechanism. And we used to have a great set of microbiome that would eat all these fungal toxins. And yum, 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 uh, we got you. They're all gone. They've been wiped off the face of our earth. And so you look at these super old guys. They've got a diverse microbiome. They've got a microbiome that's really interested in protecting their home, which is us. And another exciting thing is that you need a bunch of different bugs to produce something like butyrate, something like urolithin A, and we can get into that if you want, but you've got to have a set of bugs to do this. It, it can't, you've got to have a village to do it. Oh, I love this. Listen, we need to stop with this very simplistic good or bad, yep. especially when it comes to human health, right? Bad cholesterol, bad bacteria. I think sometimes more appropriate labels can be potentially pathogenic, can be opportunistic, but to call any of these bacteria, even E. coli, you know, right. we, 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 there's a certain amount that we actually need. Absolutely. So with this being said, what we're looking for is diversity as a hallmark and being able to have a good balance of these things. And now we've got to talk about what is disrupting 
this balance in our modern society. And with that being said, I also want to ask you about the current state of affairs of our gut health here, in particular in the United States. How's our diversity looking when it comes to our microbiome? Oh, it's a disaster. I mean, this was supposed to be inside of us a tropical rainforest, and it's been burned down to the ground. We have we've done two things simultaneously. We've uh, we've napalmed our uh, tropical rainforest with broad spectrum antibiotics. Now, broad spectrum antibiotics have only existed for fifty years. I was actually in medical school back in the dark ages, when these were introduced. And they were miraculous because you could just literally cluster bomb uh, any infection. You wouldn't have to figure out who, who was causing it, what was doing it, what antibiotic would work, what one wouldn't. You just wham, you dropped a, a nuclear bomb. And that was great, it was miraculous. What we didn't know, because we didn't know those guys were there, is we were killing all the villagers while we were after the enemy. And we see that playing out right now. We didn't know that these broad spectrum antibiotics killed our microbiome, just wiped it out. And so many of, and, and now we still use them willy nilly for anybody who's got a cough, a runny nose, a scratchy throat. These things are dispensed like candy um, still. Any woman has a urinary tract infection, bam, antibiotics. And what I talk about in gut check, these antibiotics, depending on which ones and how often they're used, can wipe out our gut microbiome for up to two years, can leave you with maybe one or two single species instead of 10,000 different species. And just like we know in California, a forest fire burns down a forest, we can go plant some little seedlings, but it's gonna be 20, 30 years before that becomes a functioning forest again. And this is number one. And those antibiotics are fed to our animals that we eat. 70% of all the antibiotics produced in the United States are given to animals, not humans. And they are a conduit directly into us. And we were talking off camera, they're given to animals to make them grow fatter and faster. And believe it or not, it's really good to make us grow fatter and faster. Um, so we're inadvertently eating this every day. Now, so that's number one, we're, we're killing them. Number two, we're starving them to death. And that's part two. So these guys are great, great-grandparents um, lived around the world, lived on uh, fermentable starches, root vegetables, things that would keep through a winter. And all of these are collectively resistant starches. They're called resistant because we don't digest them very well. We don't absorb those sugar molecules very well. And a lot is left over as it leaves the small intestine where most everything's absorbed and it goes to the colon where the vast majority of our microbiome is living. And they're down there going, okay, here it comes, here comes dinner. And so there's all this delicious soluble fiber that these guys are used to getting. So every time we would eat, our gut microbiome would go, okay, you know, two or three hours from now, dinner's going to arrive, it's going to be fine. So now all of our foods, our processed foods, our ultra-processed foods, have been devoid of fiber. And they are now super concentrated in easily absorbed, absorbable sugars and easily absorbable proteins. We've actually broken down all the proteins into individual amino acids and peptides so that, bam, everything is instantly absorbed and there's now nothing left for our gut microbiome and one of the interesting theories which i like a lot about where hunger comes from is your gut microbiome is actually what drives your hunger and if you aren't giving them anything to eat they're constantly sending little text messages to your brain 
going, what the heck? You know, where is it? Go, go find some more. And we keep eating to feed that hunger signal. There was a beautiful study done in China a few years ago to actually prove the point. It's called the, the gut-centric theory of hunger. I took some volunteers, put them on a two-week water fast. All they got was water. One group was given 100 calories of prebiotic fiber, soluble fiber. Now, we can't digest it, we can't absorb it, but it's bug food. So those guys who got those 100 calories had absolutely no hunger for two weeks. The other guys were really hungry for a while. What happened? Well, the gut buddies said, hey, thanks a lot. Got dinner. We're good. You don't have to go looking for anything else. Thank you. You fed us. Have a nice day. And you start looking around and look at Americans and then look at people who still feed their good gut buddies. And the difference is striking. Um, we're, we're the balloon people for a reason. Makes me think of the Michelin Man, uh, Stay Puft Marshmallow Man. Shout out to Ghostbusters. Yeah. Um, what about the environment itself? All right. You know, there's a lot of interesting things that we're exposed to today and also things that we're not exposed to because we're constantly kind of creating these, in quote, indoor habitats for ourselves as if we're not a part of nature. Does that play into this microbiome equation? Yeah, absolutely. You know, we know now that people who have dogs have a much healthier, more diverse gut microbiome. Uh, people who have outdoor cats uh, have a much more diverse microbiome. There's been a lot of talk about uh, forest bathing. and Shinrin Yoku. The, the interesting thing about that is there's now a, a new paper that forest bathing benefit is actually because you're actually acquiring mi microbes mm. in, from the air you know that you kick up with your feet and you've reseeded your gut with important uh, microbes from the soil and so you know like i tell everybody number one get a dog uh, number two, let the dog lick your face anytime you can get an opportunity. And yeah, and so that's one thing. But for, yeah, forest bathing. And you're right, we've, we've gotten these sterile enclosures that when, when even my kids were growing up, we had what was called a victory garden named after World War II. And I mean, we'd pull a carrot out of the soil and brush it off and eat it. it wouldn't even occur to us well let's take it inside and wash it don't it's you know it's got full of germs and dirt and now oh my gosh that would be the last thing we'd want to do so you know eat dirt <laughs> <laughs> to consolidate it eat dirt all right um so w we've already kind of looked at some of the insults that our microbiome has been faced with now let's shift gears a little bit and talk about some of the things that we can do proactively because we don't want to wait 30 years for those seedlings to start to grow. True. Uh, and the good thing is that we can make a notable difference, but we need to be intelligent. We need to be proactive in this. And in the book, you share some specific yes foods that support the health of our microbiome. So let's talk about some foods first. Yeah, so again, we've been starving these guys to death. So the more you can introduce uh, prebiotic fibers uh, in, the, in the form of tubers, artichoke hearts, for instance, are a great source. Uh, I'm a huge fan of the chicory family of vegetables, radicchio, some people call it that Italian red lettuce that now you can see in most grocery stores. Belgian endive, uh, frise. One of the things that strikes me is not odd, but when I first was visiting the south of France and Italy, almost every salad came mixed with radicchio and chicory and frise. And you go, gee, you know, that's funny. Why, why is everybody eating this stuff? Well, it's one of the best prebiotic 
containing fiber foods there is, and all these guys are eating it. The other thing that I think is is missing is that you can eat these things, but you've got to you've got to prep the microbiome. And I have a chapter that says dead men tell no tales, but dead bacteria do. And what the heck does that mean? Well, we've we've been told that probiotics are really good for us, friendly bacteria, and that fermented foods are really good for us, like like yogurts or kefir or kimchi or um, kombucha. But most of those foods do not have living bacteria. They're all dead. Uh, even if they were living, they can't make it past gastric acid for the most part. But it turns out that bacteria have information on their cell wall that is read by other bacteria. And I, I use the example of my dogs. I, we have four dogs, two rescues, three of them are male. And if you've ever had a male dog, all they want to do is sniff urine. Um, and they, you're going, you know, oh, come on, give it up. You know, what's so interesting? Well, there's lots of inform information in that urine. You know, oh, you know, Bowser was here and he had kibble for dinner last night. And, you know, I know it's him. And he gets information from that. Well, we now know that bacteria read the information on dead bacteria and actually get information of what they're supposed to do. Uh, there's a fascinating study. There's a, there's a keystone species of bacteria called Acromancia mucinophila, uh, mucus-loving Acromancia. And there won't be a test, I promise. Um, so there are actually two companies that one makes living Acromancia, the other makes dead Acromancia. And it turns out that in experiments, they both have an important effect, an actually slightly different effect. Mm. But how in the world could a dead bacteria have that effect? Well, dead bacteria tell tales. The other thing that's important is probably the most important part of fermented foods is the postbiotics that are contained in those foods. So what the heck is a postbiotic? All right, so probiotics are friendly bacteria. Prebiotics are what the friendly bacteria like to eat. And postbiotics are what the friendly bacteria poop is, I guess, the best way to describe it. It's the products of eating these things that have all the effect on our health. Those products seal our gut wall. Those products make our brain work properly. Those products make our hormones work properly. Those products keep cancer cells from growing. Those products coat the line of our blood, lining of our blood vessels. So it's these postbiotics that are critical and they're in these fermented foods. Final point. One of the exciting things is uh, polyphenols. And I've been writing about polyphenols since I started writing them. Polyphenols are these brightly colored plant compounds that it's the fall right now and we see all these beautiful fall colors. Those are the polyphenols in the leaves of the plants. What, what are they doing there? Well, polyphenols are used by the plant to protect the plant's mitochondria from sun damage and from environmental hazards. Mm -hmm. And I've written about how they work, but we eat polyphenols and we don't absorb them very well. And everybody's for years been trying to figure out, well, what the heck? We know they're good for us, but we really don't absorb them. What's the deal? It turns out that the gut microbiome think polyphenols are the best thing they've ever eaten. I, I hate to use the expression, the best thing since sliced bread. Um, and they love polyphenols. So they're a prebiotic for gut bacteria. And they then take those polyphenols, which really aren't readily absorbable, and turn them into postbiotic compounds that are, you know, 
phenomenally good for us. So what's exciting in the book is the more you can have pre-fermented polyphenols, you've kind of doubled your pleasure. Pre-fermented fermented polyphenols. Wine is a fermented polyphenol. Uh, apple cider vinegar is a fermented polyphenol. So anytime you can add these polyphenols that are already fermented, and then our gut bugs say, hey, half the work is done, uh, I'm ready to go with this stuff, you're going to double all the benefits. All right, so are you recommending that we drink wine and apple cider vinegar? Uh, yeah. Now, if you don't drink, don't start. Um, it's a slippery slope. But there's been some really interesting human studies looking at gut microbiome diversity and inflammatory markers and gut wall health. Uh, some volunteers were given grape juice. Other volunteers were given red wine. Third group of volunteers were given gin. The same amount of alcohol in the gin as was in the red wine. The red wine drinkers had the most gut diversity and the best improvement in the wall of their gut. The grape juice drinkers were close, but a little bit behind. The gin drinkers not only had no benefit, but actually had a worse gut diversity and worse gut wall health. And that explains why so many of these regions, the blue zones, and don't get a, don't get us started on that, they're, they're primarily red wine drinkers. Um, now, there is a limit, and let's, um, let's realize there's a limit. The other thing that I think is important to realize, particularly in Europe, is that wine drinking is a, is a beverage that's served with a meal. There isn't, in traditional families, there's not a happy hour where we slog, <laughs> slog down you know, two Chardonnays before we head to dinner. The wine is served as a part of the meal. And Interesting, it, yeah. it's, I think that's something we've, we've missed and to our dis, <laughs> disservice. Yeah. You know, humans develop the ability to process and use ethanol as a fuel source hundreds of thousands of years ago, earlier versions of us. And it's just like, why? Why, why, would, why would we be able to do that? And then recently, of course, because we tend to go to this other extreme and also to denature in a way, the way we've interacted with these things where we have the happy hour, for example, just pure glasses of wine, rent one after the other. And the name of like Dr. Gundry said, drink wine because I want to have a healthy gut. And, you know, to prop that up is full of antioxidants, whatever. But realizing that the way that this has been utilized recently is not what we've been doing for the past few centuries. And so recently, many of our colleagues have been really going hard on the fact that alcohol of any type is something to avoid. Now, you mentioned gin, which is, this is not naturally derived ethanol. This is distillation. This is something where right. humans were like, there's not enough alcohol in this alcohol. Let's do more. Let's figure out a way to have more that this can rapidly potentially damage our gut. And also this creates some of the potential damage with our nervous system and brain, all that stuff faster. Now, with that being said, if we're looking at, again, not placing the good or bad label on something, especially humans have been doing for thousands of years, let's look at the context in which we see the consumption of something like red wine, which is, wow, that's really interesting that these different blue zones have incorporated this. Let's not ignore that, that that right. exists. And also, you just said the thing which nobody said, which is with food. Yeah. And that interaction with food with potential uh, prebiotic fibers and with like, there's some potential magical and with, stuff happening. And with family. And with family, that part. And you know, let's get back to your cookbook. Yeah, yeah. With, with family. It was part of a family gathering and it was a normal part. In fact, a little off subject, there's an interesting theory that the, uh, beer was first made when grains were cultivated about 12,000 years ago. And there's an interesting theory that it wasn't grains and bread that fostered civilization. 
it was actually alcohol from the fermentation of grains that made living in close quarters possible. Interesting, interesting. Think about that for a while. Now, <laughs> I've got my youngest son, Brayden, here in the house. <laughs> so, Brayden, does mommy like wine? Yeah. Do I? No. All right, so I'm not a drinker, and I'm curious where I can find some of these benefits, and you mentioned apple cider vinegar. Yeah. So can you talk about that a little yeah, bit? Yeah, so vinegars, vinegars have a short chain fatty acid uh, that most of them have acetic acid acetate. Uh, some have malic acid, acid malate, which are really important precursors for making the most important short chain fatty acid butyrate. And you've got to have these precursors. It's something that we just didn't get. So when people say, oh, apple cider vinegar is good for you and make sure you have the mother. Well, guess what the mother is? The mother are the dead bacteria and they're carrying information. So anytime you can add vinegar to something, uh, do yourself a favor and do it. A uh, fun study, uh, there've been two studies looking at women who drink champagne in France, of course, and women who drink champagne have better vascular health and better brain health than women who don't drink champagne. But it gets better than that. Women who drink uh, vintage champagne, vintage champagne has, is, is a certain year, and it has to sit what's called on the lees, which is all the dead stuff, for a minimum of six years. Uh, regular champagne has to sit for two years. Uh, to be considered champagne. So what's really interesting is they do better by drinking vintage champagne, which has had another four or five years of exposure to this information from dead yeast, from dead bacteria, that actually improves their health. Speaking of dead, uh, years ago there was a a brewer's yeast factory that they noticed that the people who worked in the factory seemed to never get colds, never get flu. And in the rest of the town, people did. And they're going, well, that's, that's weird. Why, why is that? So they said, well, it's got to be something, you know, in the air in the factory. And they realized it was a dead yeast, Saccharomyces, Saccharomyces, Saccharomyces boilodi, sorry, uh, that just the dead yeast was actually dramatically affecting the immune system, mm. improving the immune system. And just this week, there's been a study out giving this particular yeast to people with MS and a placebo-controlled study and dramatic improvement in MS from this dead yeast. And so they're, they're carrying information. Mm. So dead bacteria and yeast tell tales that we can't read, but clearly our immune system can read and the microbiome can read. It's this really is, exciting. Yeah, it's fascinating, fascinating. All right, so we've dug into food a little bit and you go into obviously so much more detail in the book. Are there any other lifestyle factors for us to pay attention to if we're looking to improve the diversity of our of our microbiome and just improve our gut health overall? Uh, you you want to get into the rabbit hole of new 5GC? Bring it on. All right. Um, so I, I kind of end, end the, the first part of the book with a chapter called Plant Paradox 2.0. So it's been almost seven years since I wrote The Plant Paradox. And one of the controversial things in the plant paradox was there's a sugar molecule that uh, lines the lining of our gut, lines the lining of our blood vessels, that lines our blood-brain barrier, that lines our joints, that's called NU5AC, capital A. Uh, cows, pigs, sheep have a very similar sugar molecule 
in their bodies called Nu5G, capital G, C. Those molecules are identical except for one oxygen molecule. That's the only difference. Here's the bad news. When we eat Nu5G, C containing foods, and milk, by the way, has Nu5G, C, we make antibodies to it as if it is a foreign compound and we make aggressive antibodies to it. We hate it, okay? And we can take human volunteers and have you eat some new 5GC containing food and within hours you'll have major antibodies to new 5GC. Why was I so interested in that? Well, as a, as a transplant surgeon and as a xenotransplant surgeon, we fiddled with using pigs as a transplant for humans. Makes sense. And you've heard recently of two of these uh, attempts. We failed every time because we discovered this molecule on the blood vessels of pigs, Nu5GC. And our, our immune system went after it just with a vengeance. In fact, you would clot the pig's heart in a couple hours. Just, it was that aggressive. These transplants have been bred to have new 5 ac our antibody, I mean our sugar molecule. Okay, so this is, this is a bad actor. Now, so what? Well, since we make antibodies to new 5 gc and new 5 ac is so similar that the theory was that we attack our own sugar molecule in molecular mimicry. And that would explain there's a strong association between red meat eating and heart disease, arthritis, dementia, and cancer. Very strong. Now, association does not mean causation. First to admit it. But what's new in this book is we now know that new 5 gc this bad sugar molecule, can replace the new 5 ac that lines our blood vessels, our joints, our blood-brain barrier. New 5 gc even animals who have new 5 gc will not let new 5 gc into their brain because it creates neuroinflammation. And if you put new 5 gc into the brain, you get massive neuroinflammation. So what happens now is, since we make antibodies to this, we now realize that we're attacking new 5 gc that's incorporated into our blood vessels, into our joints, into our blood-brain barrier. And cancer cells use new 5 gc to actually stimulate the immune system to cause inf inflammation, and they love inflammation. It keeps actually them safe. Now, what do we do about that? The good news is, the more, the bad news is, the more new 5GC foods you eat, the more you'll make new 5GC in all these spots, and the more we'll attack it. The good news is, the more we eat new 5AC foods, and those are present in chicken and fish and shellfish, you'll displace the new 5GC out and you'll put new 5 ac back in. So that's the good news. But what about all these super old people in Sardinia and Crete, and they're eating sausages. In fact, the longest living people in the world are, is a country called Andorra, which is high in the Pyrenees Mountains between Spain and France. These people have a life expectancy of 90 years. They're the longest life expectancy in the world. What do they live on? Sheep cheese and sausages. And you go, well, that doesn't sound like a good idea. Well, it turns out that bacteria love sugar molecules. And new 5 gc happens to be a delicious sugar molecule. So these Traditional people always ferment their sausages. Cheeses are always fermented. And the good news is there is no new 5GC in traditional fermented sausages and cheeses. 
So that explains why all these Europeans are having the charcuterie board with all these salamis and sausages and cheeses, and they're actually getting a benefit and they're not being harmed by the new 5GC because it's been eaten. So you can kind of have your cake and eat it too. So uh, get yourself some traditionally made sausages, you know, from Italy or France or Portugal. Don't buy ours. We don't do that process. And use traditional cheeses like Parmesan or Pecorino. And it's all in the book. So you, But buyer beware. So the sad thing is, like I conclude that chapter, your grass-fed, grass-finished beef on your whole wheat bun is probably killing you. Why, Dr. G? Why do you got to create controversy? It's, it's, it's in my nature. <laughs> and if the, the liver man is watching, liver has the highest amount of new, new 5GC of any food. The liver man. The liver man. Now, I've got to ask you about this as well. Does this speak to, you know, just talking about some of these long-lived cultures and folks who are still, you know, we have kind of hunter-gatherer versions of folks around today, but, you know, civilizations like, you know, the Native Americans and their relationship with the buffalo and all yeah. these things, could that, you know, and greatly comparative to our health today, reduced onset of things like heart disease and all these old neurodegenerative conditions, could it be that the health of their microbiome was so much more robust and this is why we don't see that same correlation with these folks yeah the other thing that's interesting is that the microbiome is more than happy to eat new 5gc uh, but that microbiome is basically down in our colon and new 5gc is absorbed in the small intestine so it gets absorbed before the microbiome can get to it but you bring up a very good point. If we actually ate food the way they were traditionally prepared long ago, first of all, we would have aged our beef. And if you think about it, I grew up in Omaha, Nebraska, and aged steaks uh, were hanging everywhere. And there was mold on them. And there was, and it turns out the aging was actually fermenting the beef. And so there wasn't any new 5GC. And again, you look at what cultures do. The Indians made, you know, they couldn't, couldn't eat that many buffalo right away, so they had to preserve the meat. So they pounded, you know, berries in it and then let it dry and rot. So it fermented naturally. And so there were always, they didn't know it, but those were the only ways food could be kept. And these cultures that, you know, don't eat a lot of meat, these long-lived societies, they're eating the whole hog. There's an expression in one of my books, for a year I feed the pig, and then for a year the pig feeds me. And that's a good deal. But the pig had to be preserved by fermentation, by make, grinding it up and putting it into sausages. And it took away the harm. I mean, it's really cool how people... Cultures have always figured out how to detoxify right. things that were meant to kill them. And this information was passed down yep. until recently. We're like, F it, give me a Twinkie. Yeah. You know, yeah. it's just it's so crazy. And the solutions are so much more simple, but it's just a shift in our culture. And we can start that within our own household. And you've got the blueprint for us in Gut Check on so many of these different inputs, because that's what it's, what it's really about is exposing ourselves to certain inputs, food is information, you know, our environment is information, and also doing our best to avoid other inputs that create derangement. And again, it's a really special gift. You're a phenomenal writer and communicator, obviously, and just somebody's been a continuous source of inspiration for me. Can you let folks know where to pick up Gut Check and just where to connect with you in general? Well, wherever books are sold, uh Please, 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 if uh, the COVID epidemic taught us anything, it's uh, help out your local bookseller. Um, they're making a comeback, but they were dead in the water. So, but, you know, Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Target, uh, but find your local bookseller. 
it'll be there, I promise. Uh, you can find me at drgundry.com. You can find me at gundrymd.com, my supplement and food company. Uh, the Dr. Gundry Podcast, which we've recently welcomed Sean again uh, to, to have. My two YouTube channels, and hopefully if you're scrolling the internet, I pop up waving at you every day, I hope. So. <laughs> you do, you follow us. I love it. And you're somebody truly, you're, you're so shareable for folks who have questions, you know, uh, family members, like being able to send one of your videos is, is such a valuable gift. So I highly encourage everybody to make sure they're following you. Definitely check out your YouTube channel. And most importantly, pick up a copy of Gut Check today. Thank Dr. You. Gundry, thank you for coming it. to hang out. Thanks. Good to see you again. Hey, if you like this video, make sure to check out this video right here. This was all the stuff that I used to recover from toxic mold and obesity and brain fog and chronic fatigue and all that, as well as stuff I used to upgrade myself. So I'm like, how, how do we make it available? And after eight years of testing all kinds of stuff and talking with thousands and thousands of members, these five buckets emerged.